right, hello and welcome everyone to Dairy World Tour episode three. For any newcomers joining us for your first episode today, my name is Ann Lakuta. I'm one of the health and wellness managers with Dairy West and I get to be your Dairy World Tour host. And today we are visiting Greece. We're gonna hear all about the Greek culture, the Greek cuisine. And once again, we have two incredibly impressive speakers with us today. So Chef Melina Milianis is our guest culinary expert and chef. Uh, Melina is owner of NJ Sweet Spots, where she creates decadent desserts that you'll find all over New Jersey and New York City restaurants. She's also cooked with many celebrity Greek chefs, including Diane Kochilas and Maria Loy. And she's also heads the uh, regional culinary talent at William Sonoma. So we're gonna get to cook along with Melina in a minute. We're gonna hear from her, but we also have Serena Ball joining us and she is our nutrition expert for the episode today. She's also a registered dietitian nutritionist. Serena's also a co-founder and blogger at teaspoonofspice.com. She's co-authored two cookbooks that both focus on the Mediterranean cuisine with tons of Greek inspired dishes. And she's also a contributor to foodnetwork.com. So those are just a quick bit of nuggets about Melina and Serena. In just a minute, we're gonna bring them on. The fun's gonna start and we're gonna hear more about their story and their connection to Greece. All right, so our Greece product box. Most of you should have received your product box by now, um, but I did wanna acknowledge that we're aware that there were some delays for the boxes. Um, so just know that we're working through the issues with UPS and you'll hear from us soon on next steps. Um, but our Greece product box is awesome this time. So we have, again, a delicious variety of local Idaho and Utah dairy products that are utilized in some of the Greek recipes that both Serena and Melina provided for us today. So as you can see on the screen, you have Ballard's Idaho grilling cheese, which is a halloumi style cheese. We have Gold Greek Farms feta. We have high desert butter. And then we also have Slide Ridge raw honey, which is out of Utah. So again, all of these ingredients were utilized in the recipes and you're gonna hear more about each of them um, from, from both Melina in her demo and then Serena when she's talking about some of the nutrition of Greek cuisine. And then don't forget, if you're loving your experience and you're taking photos when you're cooking your recipes and of the products, share them with us on social media. We'd love to see your photos and you can tag us at hashtag Dairy World Tour. And then at the end of the presentation, we're sharing Melina and Serena's um, Instagram handles so you can tag them as well. All right, so today about halfway through the episode, Melina is gonna be demoing her tiro pita, which is a traditional Greek cheese pie. And so you'll see all the ingredients um, on the screen right now. And so if you haven't yet and you're planning to cook along, go ahead and gather those. There really wasn't much other prep involved. So just get your ingredients, um, go ahead and get your kitchen tools. And if you do have phyllo dough that was frozen, go ahead and take that out of the freezer now so it has a bit of time to thaw before the demo. All right, and then we're actually going to um, pop this recipe into the chat. So go ahead and check out the chat with me now because we are going to utilize it throughout the episode. We want you to engage with us and with each other via the chat. So check out the bottom of your screen and click on the chat button and you should see a chat tab pop up on the right hand of your screen and you'll see some people are already using it. We're popping some tips in there, putting the recipes in. Um, if you haven't chatted yet, go ahead and tell us your name and where you're joining from. We'd love to know who's on the line. And then you'll also notice that you can chat to everyone that's joining us today or you can actually use the drop down box to chat to an individual. So if you have a family member or a friend on the line and you wanna connect with them, feel free to do that via the chat as well. And then we're using the chat for all of your questions. So go ahead and type them up, um, put them in the chat box as you think of them. We have team members that are monitoring throughout. So we're gonna keep a list of all these questions and make sure that we answer as many as possible at the end, because we've set aside about 10 minutes for Q and A at that time. Um, the exception to that is Melina is going to go ahead and take questions live during her demo. So we want to make sure you're able to follow along, that you get all the clarity on instructions that you need. So go ahead and ask those in the moment. I'll be watching and I'll be able to ask them to Melina for you. Okay, so we have one more thing before we officially start the show. So we have a poll question for all of you. Uh, you're going to see this pop up on your screen in just a minute. 
So we're wondering, have you visited Greece before? Um, go ahead and take, you know, 15 seconds or so to tell us if, if you've been um, never, but you want to go. Maybe you've been once, maybe multiple times. Perhaps you lived there. We'll give everyone a few more seconds and then we're going to share the results. We got a lot of, a lot of answers coming in here. All right, so everyone should see the shared poll result results. So wow, 82% never been to Greece before. I would say of our Dairy World tour destinations, this is probably the least visited. So we're going to learn a ton about it then from Serena and Melina and it's on all of our bucket list. A couple people have been there one time, multiple times, and a lucky two people go there every chance they get. So all right, let's um let's go ahead and welcome Serena and Melina to the stage. Hello. So um, if you've joined our episodes before, you know that we kick each of them off by asking each of our guest speakers a question. So they get to tell their own story and you, you get to know them through their own words. So we're going to start this time with Melina. And Chef Melina, just share with us, what does food mean to you and how has your connection to Greece impacted that meaning? Uh, food to me, hands down, is always memories. I feel like when I travel, I remember a certain uh, place that I visited that I stereotype of certain food to. It reminds me of family members, a certain restaurant, friendships. So many, so many memories are attached. My recipes, they all have memories. They all uh, have come from a family member, a place that I visited. So for me, in my heart, hands down, food to me is always memories. Wonderful. And Serena, what about you? Same question. What does food mean to you? And how has your connection to Greece impacted that meaning? Sure. So hi, everyone. So glad to be here today. So my fascination with food sort of began when I was a child. I grew up on a cattle ranch in Montana. And so we ate, yes, it's as beautiful as it sounds, and actually right near Idaho. So hi to those of you who are in my, neighbor, in my neighboring state, although I don't live there now. But I grew up on this ranch where we really ate very seasonally. We grew pretty much everything that we ate. So summers were spent uh, putting up everything. So freezing and canning everything. And then I really had that connection to food, decided to maybe become a chef, but decided to be a registered dietitian instead. And I'm so glad I did. I use practically everything I learn um, almost every day. Um, I have five children and I see clients often. And so I use everything that I learned and it was actually during my college time that I worked at a Greek restaurant. I was a waitress there in, wait for it, Fargo, North Dakota. There were two Greek immigrants that opened this amazing Greek restaurant there and they made everything from scratch, the pastizio, the galakabutikos, tzatziki sauce, hummus. Um, I didn't learn how to make any of it though, um, but they did teach me how to make a really great a cup of Greek coffee. Um, but after college, I decided I'm going to learn how to make these things that I saw being served all the time. Um, so I did. I researched them and learned to bake them. And then after I was married, um, my husband and I traveled to several places in Greece and fell in love with the culture and the cuisine there. Um, I then started a blog with my business partner, Deanna, and we have published two cookbooks since then. The first one, uh, the 30-Minute Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, has become a bestseller and sold over 150,000 copies. And the second one, Easy Everyday Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, um, both are full of Greek recipes. And um, the second one's doing really well. It has tons more pictures than the first one. So I really love the beautiful pictures in that one. And so I cook a lot of uh, Mediterranean and Greek food every day just for my family, which is really fun because you can sort of transport yourself. And as Melina said, all those memories come flooding back when you cook that food. And I actually have um, four girls and one boy and all my girls have Greek names. I have a Sophia, an Alethea, a Zoe and an Irene. So that is my little connection to Greeks. And I'm going to jump right in now. So I think we're going to put the first slide up, right, Anne? Yep, we got it. All right. All right. So we are going to go a little on a little travel here. 
So the circled area is where you see Greece. It's right next to our first Dairy World tour. Um, Italy is sticking out that little boat boot, and then that right there to the right is Greece, that little peninsula sticking out of Western Europe there. Next slide. And this is what the country of Greece looks like. It's actually mainland plus almost 3,000 islands, depending on how you um, categorize an island. About 225 of them are inhabited, but there are a lot of islands in Greece. And so you think about the Greek Isles, that's what you're, um, if you get a chance to island hop, which we're going to do today, you might go to the Cyclades, which is a group of islands there circled right in the middle. There's about um, 200 islands themselves, small ones, along with 20 uh, larger ones, some that you might have heard of like Mykonos uh, and Santorini, right there at the bottom of the screen. We're also going to island hop today to Idra, which is right south of Athens. And then we're also going to go over to Ikaria and Angaina, also south of Athens there. So we're going to uh, hop right around to visit several of those islands today. Okay, next slide. So the country of Greece was um, started out with a group of city-states way back in the 8th century BC. They were already organized back at that time. And then in about the 4th century BC, Philip of Macedonia, um, sorry, Philip of Macedonia and then his son Alexander the Great brought them all together and conquered much of what was the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. And so that's what helped spread part of Greek culture around the world. And then as um, we heard in our first Italian world tour, it was the Romans that conquered Greece in the second century BC. And what was surprising about that conqueror is that Greece uh, was so uh, amazing and some of the Greek uh, culture and literature and democracy and customs that the Romans actually adopted several of the um, the things that of the people that they conquered. So because the Holy Roman Emperor was so giant, it was able to Greek culture and cuisine was actually able to spread throughout the Holy Roman Emperor, which covered much of um, the settled world world at that time. All right, next slide. All right, this is the Parthenon, one the probably the most famous landmark in Greece. That is Melina's son right there in the front. And it is in Athens, of course. And what's so interesting is that the most famous landmark of Greece is Athens. Well, it is in Athens, which is a city, which in itself is very beautiful. But much of the architecture in Athens, um, the old, old, old architecture has been restored. And most of the city is built post uh, World War II. But there are a few remaining um, landmarks there. So if you go, make sure you see, obviously, the Parthenon, which is located on the hill, which is the Acropolis. And then there's a temple to Zeus there. There's also several very beautiful um, Greek Orthodox churches that um, go back quite a ways that you would definitely want to see as well. But most of the rest of the city is pretty modern. But if you go to some islands, next slide, please, you're going to see more um, older buildings um, that have remained. But this slide is very typical what uh, the country of Greece looks like. It's very mountainous. In fact, 80% of Greece is mountainous. And that's why it's so interesting that about 4% um, of the country's GDP comes from agriculture. And even more amazing that they can produce so many delicious foods and um, foods of the Mediterranean um, in Greece. So Greece is actually the number one producer of pistachios in the EU. They are second for um, rice and olives, and they are the third largest producer of figs, almonds, tomatoes, and watermelon. And of course, you might recognize many of those being a foundation of the Mediterranean diet, especially olives. People around the uh, Mediterranean region 
eat olives and olive oil, but actually the olive fruit almost every day and almost at every meal. All right, next slide, please. So it is also, this is also a very typical scene in Greece. Um, this is on the island of Idra, and this is obviously a beautiful coastline. Greece itself has 9,400 miles of beautiful coastlands. And this one, obviously you can see some of the boats and the fishing boats, and then um, the beautiful sloping uh, coastline there with the buildings built on there. That is what much of the coastline looks like. And it's in these beautiful, um, in the harbors and on the coastlines that obviously seafood is um, harvested and Greeks eat a lot of seafood, but especially small fishes. So we might recognize um, anchovies and sardines, but there's also tons of local small fishes that are very, um, a big part of the Greek diet um, is those small fishes, which is interesting because that is now what experts are rec recommending is to try to eat some of those smaller fishes, which are made more sustainable, but Greeks have been doing that for a very, very long time. All right, next slide, please. All right, here I am on the island of Santorini. And it's very famous for its whitewashed buildings, which you can see in the background there. All right, next slide. And also the island is famous for being a caldera, which is a big round circle there, which is the top of a blown off volcano. So it was an underwater mountain that basically blew its top about in the time of Exodus. So it's got a round um, caldera there that it provides a very nice harbor for cruise ships to come into. So if you've ever gone on a Mediterranean cruise, you've probably stopped in, which I guess not very many of you have, but you should. Um, but you can see when, uh, when you're on Santorini, you see the cruise ships docked out there. And it also, of course, provides um, amazing harbors for fishing as well. But it's also beautiful volcanic soil. And so a lot of the things that grow there on Santorini benefit from that volcanic soil and it's actually still a live volcano as well. All right, next slide. This is also what Santorini is famous for, these beautiful whitewashed buildings with the blue domed um, roofs like that. And you can see that how the island sort of um, goes around to the left of your slide, it um, follows out there. At the very end is the, is the town of Ia, and my husband and I actually walked from this town here, which is Fira, all along the tippy top of the uh, ridges there to down to the uh, sunsets. And that's one of the most famous things to do on the island is to watch the sunset from the town of Ia. But you can also see as you're walking along there, it's a long walk, it's very hot. <laughs> um, but you can see part of the cuisine there. You can see the tomatoes growing. You can see the amazing vineyards with the, um, wines that are produced right there on the island and benefit from that volcanic soil. You can also see people out uh, gathering uh, herbs and foraging for herbs, some wild fennel and other ones that grow along there. All right, next slide. So Santorini is very famous for its Santorini tomatoes. They are everywhere. They were in the most delicious sandwich that I've ever had in my whole life. Um, it was a falafel sandwich. So of course, falafel is fried chickpea balls that are normally green from all the herbs and parsley that are in them. But these uh, uh, chickpea balls or, or falafel on Santorini were actually red because they had a lot of Santorini tomatoes in there. It was served wrapped up in a filo dough with some creamy tzatziki sauce and it had even more tomatoes in it and it was so good. Um, but this is a picture of the Santorini salad. So most of you are probably familiar with a Greek salad, which would be tomatoes and peppers, onions, olives, and feta cheese and cucumbers. But on Santorini, they add their signature caper berries and caper leaves, which grow wild there and are also foraged and then pickled. And the reason why the Santorini tomatoes are so famous is because again of that volcanic soil. They're high in acid, and high in carbohydrates or sugar. So it's that yummy, sweet, uh, tart um, balance of flavors that makes um, food so delicious that we'll talk about a little bit more later is that yummy acid that makes everything taste so good. All right, next slide, please. Now we're ho hopping over to the island of Ikaria. 
So this is a very isolated um, island. You may remember from the very first slide that it was way over on the right-hand side of your screen, sort of all by itself. And Icaria is known for to be a blue zone. Um, it is, and one of the reasons it is a blue zone is because it is so isolated and the people there have been able to maintain their food traditions and the foods that um, their ancestors have eaten for many, many years and live to be 100. So there's more um, in blue zones across the world, there's more people who live to 100 than other places around the world. So researchers have studied why do they live so long and, and not only do they live long, but they're very, very healthy and have low risk, of, have low um, incidence of disease as they're um, at, at those uh, older ages. Next slide. So what do the Icarians eat? They eat a rather short list of lots of very uh, nutritious foods. First being feta, feta cheese, black eyed peas, split peas, fava beans, lemons, foraged greens. You often see people out foraging for greens in um, Icaria. It's just what people do. They're all throughout the year. There's different ones that um, come up. Um, and on a side note, one of the best places for us to forage uh, for greens might be in your garden. I know right now I have two lovely greens that are growing in my garden that are wild and super high in nutrition, being dandelion greens, yay, and purslane. So look that one up. It's sort of a succulent and it has a yummy lemon flavor. So that's a fun one to look like. Look at, and I know it grow. I know it grows in Montana, so I'm sure that it grows in Idaho and probably Utah too. Uh, also potatoes. People on the whole of Greece eating a lot of potatoes. They actually eat more potatoes than Americans. They eat around 55 kilograms a year of potatoes and Americans only eat 52 kilograms of potatoes a year. They, Icarians also eat herbs, lots and lots of wild herbs, sage, rosemary, mint, uh, marjoram. And a lot of times they drink that in herbal teas, especially in the morning. So starting the day out with uh, herbal tea, which is high in antioxidants and other um, benefits. Also coffee and local honey. They often use that honey to sweeten their tea in the morning. All right, next slide. And then this is on the island of Spetsits. And that was, again, sort of right south of Athens. And this is a beautiful picture of a Greek Orthodox church. And that actually this particular one is the um, chapel to the patron saint of Spetsit. So each island has their own, um, their own uh, patron saint, and this is the one to the island of Spetsit. And what's so interesting is the Greek Orthodox Church has actually been the one to help sort of shape Greek identity in the modern times and help transmit a lot of those uh, Greek food traditions throughout the world. So anytime that the people immigrated to other parts of the world, they brought their um, Greek traditions of food, especially around high holy holidays from um, uh, Christmas, Easter, and other uh, holidays around the world and transfer those to uh, the, the areas they are. And if you do go to Greece, one of the very best things to pick up while you're there, one of the very best souvenirs are all of the hot handmade icons. I have one here. Several of them are just absolutely beautiful and you can still find them made by local artists. So there I'm leaving you with a little uh, souvenir of what to take on your travels. And I will uh, transfer the slide control over to Melina. Hi everybody, welcome, Kalos irtate. Today, welcome to my Greek kitchen here in New Jersey. I wish you were all in Greece with me. I can't believe that most of you have not even been there yet. So I'm thinking, I'm working on a plan for all of us to get there together. You should all travel with me. I guarantee you it's gonna be the trip of a lifetime, for sure. <laughs> this is the beautiful island of Spetses. It is found in the Saronic Gulf off of Greece. This is the furthest island in the Saronic Gulf. The Saronic Gulf is very close to Athens. There are no airports. Uh, the only means of transportation to get to these islands um, are via ferry or taking a road trip along the Peloponnesian coast and water taxiing over. 
There are no cars on these islands. Uh, you can get around by foot, uh, horse and buggy. Uh, either you can get around by donkey. And there are a couple taxis, local taxis. Um, but other than that, uh, motorcycle or by foot is definitely means of transportation. This picture that you're seeing right now is actually a true farm to table restaurant on the highest point of uh, Spetses. It is owned by the largest hotel, the Posidonian Grand, the Poseidon Grand Hotel. They do all kinds of hands-on cooking classes up there and fabulous dinners and lunches and brunches. And from this farm, they actually feed the whole hotel. So breakfasts, you know, the eggs all come from this farm. They make their own cheeses from the goats that are on this farm. And all the herbs and vegetables are all harvested right here on this uh, Bostani in the mountain. Uh, Spets has actually uh, played a really important role back in uh, the day. Uh, it was a very, uh, had a very large naval history. Uh, it was very, very strong. It had a shipping wealth, uh, played a part in fighting with the Ottoman Empire, actually. They were one of the first people during that war to raise their flag, uh, pretty much saying, uh, symbolizing resistance to the war. The flag was actually raised at the Church of St. Nicholas, which is today the patron saint of the island. And he is actually the saint who watches over the sailors and anybody at sea. So it has a very significant um, meaning with that patron saint. So if you wanna go to the next slide now, we'll talk about a little bit about the island of Egina. Egina uh, is one of the closest islands to Athens. It's only a 40 minute ferry ride. Um, and this is actually the Temple of Afe. I'll talk about it in a few minutes. The island, it has a very mythological and a nice little chunk of history in it as well. It's uh, actually name came from a nymph. The nymph was known to have been carried away by Zeus and he brought her here to hide her on this island. She gave birth to a son and the son in contribution named the island after his mother, Aegina. So it has a nice little twist to it. And then Aphea came in years later. Apparently, she was an, a goddess that was being attacked. And the stories changed quite often, so I'm not sure which one. But one story saying that uh, it was an angry gods that were after her. And another story said that it was sailors that were um, uh, giving her grief by the, by the shore. And Another goddess came, swooped her, and she, she fled up to the mountain and just disappeared. And in her honor, this temple of Aphea came about. So it's still there. It's beautiful. If you ever get to Athens, you can do this in a day trip and visit. Um, and Serena was talking also about the uh, pistachios, how they have come from Greece. Well, it is actually Egina that is the main, main staple of pistachios throughout Greece. Uh, they, the soil, the soil is very chalky. It's a very dry climate and they don't get a lot of um, water. The, they get a lot of breeze from the Mediterranean, from the sea, and that helps actually pollinate the fruit. So the, the pistachio is actually a smaller nut. It's kind of pinkish on the inside and it's actually got a really sweet taste. So it's quite different than the pistachios you've seen here. Um, another little bit about Egina too, um, they actually were one of the first for minting the first coins in Greece. So they did play a lot, a good part there. And they also developed the first standard of weights and measurements that actually were used all throughout Greece. So that's my little story about Egina. And I would like to get into starting to cook here for you. This is the port right down there and right through these doors because there's beautiful doors all through Greece and I wish I was walking through them right now and opening you all up to an island, but I'm only on the kitchen island. Uh, so we are going to go into a little demonstration, a quick one on this melomacarona cheesecake that I created a couple years ago. Uh, I kind of put it on the back burner because I hated making cheesecakes because of all of the process and waiting time and the cooking time. Um, but then I invented, then I discovered this Instant Pot actually while I was at work at Williams Sonoma, and this was the saving grace of my cheesecake recipe. So just to give you a little brief background, I know everybody thinks that cheesecake was 
a New York thing and being a New Yorker, I don't want to, you know, say it wasn't, but it wasn't. Uh, actually, cheesecake from goes back to ancient Greece. From the first Olympic Games, cheesecake was one of the staple foods given to the athletes in the first Olympic game, which was in 776 BC. It helped provide energy for all the athletes to help them get through all their games. The earliest cheesecake recipe um, recorded was by a writer called Athenaeus in 230 AD. And you can actually find that recipe online. It's quite simple, not as intricate as the cheesecake we all know today. Uh, and it wasn't until the late 19th century that New York actually started kicking their game up and getting into the cheesecake game. So this cheesecake that I invented is actually kind of like my little, wow, you can you say, combination of ancient Greece and modern Greece, because I have my ancient Greek cheesecake with a little uh, Greek yogurt in there and my modern Greek uh, cookies. These are a honey-based cookie. Melo Makarona is the name. Melo, Melo Makarona, Meli is the, the honey. Uh, very orange-based. Uh, we use these a lot around Christmas time during the holidays. And it is one of my favorite cookies. So I wanted to incorporate it and make it into our crust for the cheesecake. So if all of you, if you don't have an Instant Pot at your house, this is a great, great tool to have. It makes the best cheesecake. And even if you only use it for that, I suggest you get one. You're gonna take your little stand. It's really easy. You're gonna put a little water in your pot. It comes with this little stand, which is great because this is kind of your water bath. So you don't have to use your oven. You put it in, you're gonna take your cheesecake in your springform pan, cover it with foil, place it in, seal it. And you're gonna just push it aside, set it for 25 minutes. Let it just sit when it's done for about five, 10 minutes till the uh, steam actually naturally releases a little bit. And your cheesecake is gonna come out. When I tell you perfect, I mean perfect. If you can see this, no cracks, nothing. It's this beautiful, beautiful cheesecake. We're gonna open it. Hopefully this opens perfectly. Yeah, there we go. Look how gorgeous. Hey, Melina, we have a question yeah. for you. So some Tammy asked, where can you buy the cookies? Uh, the only place that I know that sells them, and I don't know, you can check their website if they ship out, Kantos Foods, K-O-N-T-O-S, does make these cookies in batches. And if they ship, I know that they do have them frozen there, so hopefully they will be able to ship to you because theirs are really amazing. You did get my recipe, so if you want to try and work through them, if you ever have questions, you can always email me, write me a message on Instagram. I will always answer to anybody. Yeah, uh, and just to say, Melina's um, Milo Macarena cookie recipe is on unbottled.com, so we'll pop that into the chat, too. You guys got to make them. They're so good. Yeah. So then I just kind of crumbled the rest of the cookies right on top, because why wouldn't you want more cookies on the top? It's so good. So they got a nice honey, orange, cinnamon flavor, clove, all the, all the good, good spices of Greece. Oh, here, Melina. Okay, so we have another question. I had, Marsha says, I had the most incredible cinnamon shortbread cookie on Santorini. It was given to me while I was waiting for a cooking class to begin. The restaurant oh. would not share the recipe. Any idea of what it might have been? Yes, yes, yes. I guarantee you it was a mustakulura cookie. Um, I have been making this, I've been, I have been trying to perfect this cookie and actually did uh, just about two weeks ago. It's, um, it's, it's used, we use another spice in Greece. It's not molasses, it's called petsimezi. It's kind of like a molasses, except it's, uh, it's a little thinner and a little bit sweeter. Uh, so if you can find it at a European Mediterranean market, anywhere local, that the cookie is called mustokulura. It's, it's very cinnamon, very clove. Um, there's actually no dairy in it. It's, it's an olive oil based cookie, but it is delicious. Sounds delicious. Okay, so our little uh, cheesecake here is done. I wish you guys were all here so I can give you a little sample because it looks so good and it smells divine. Just divine. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a slice. 
Yes, I would love to give you all a slice. When I come to visit you all, because I may show up at your homes, maybe I will make one with you. Okay, so we are going to move on right now. I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite foods to eat when I'm in Greece. Um, it's a staple dish pretty much there. It is called tiropita. Can everybody say that with me, please? You have to roll your R, tiro pita. Pita in Greece uh, means pie. So anytime you're, if they say to you, if you're at a restaurant and it says pitas, it means they have some kind of savory or sweet pie. Uh, pies in Greece can be either savory or sweet. Savory pies are pretty much a staple uh, in the in the Greek household, especially during the winter months, it's uh, you, you basically use your seasonal vegetables and make any type of pie you can create from the things you have in your yard or your refrigerator. Uh, so I wanted to do the tiropita, the cheese pie for you because in my house, at least, this is all of our favorite and it's the basic staple to anything else you want to add to it. You always want to start with your basic cheese ingredients, and then you can factor in if you want to make a spinach pie, aka the spanakopita, you're going to add your spinach. If you want to do a leek pie, you're going to take your basic cheeses, saute your leeks, some scallions, some dill, throw it right in, zucchini. I mean, the list goes on and on. Any type of um, vegetable that you would like to add to this, it's going to come out amazing. I've done it with potatoes and zucchini. Um, I do sweet pies constantly, like I make up creations like there's no tomorrow. Um, so I want to get started um, just with the basic ingredients here, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about phyllo dough. Hold on, I got to get something to clean my hands. Okay, so we are going to get in our bowl our ingredients. You guys all have my uh, cheese pie ingredient list with you. We're going to do basic feta cheese, uh, we have our cream cheese and ricotta cheese. So in my bowl, and you know, it's you want to keep your ingredients room temperature, because to work with your hands on freezing cold ingredients out of the refrigerator, your hands are like frozen from the cold. And your feta cheese, you always want to make sure it's crumbled. Now, the reason I use my hands is because I need to feel every ingredient in here. Uh, I kind of make feta cheese like my star of the show. Like this is their show. This is feta cheese's moment. So I don't want anybody to really know what else is in here. I want you to take a bite and say, wow, that's so good. I taste the feta. There's some other hidden ingredient in there. I can't really tell what it is. That's why I mix with my hands because I want everything to be so finely incorporated that you can't tell who who the other people are in this little ingredient. But the cheese definitely needs to stand out because this is it's tiropita. That's what it's here for. So you want to make sure that cream cheese is is all incorporated nicely. You don't want chunks of cream cheese sticking out. And now we're going to add our egg. And cheese is a huge um, part of the Mediterranean diet, uh, especially on the islands where they don't tend to eat a lot of meats. Uh, cheese is there for uh, protein, for dairy. So we do tend to eat a lot of cheeses throughout the day, starting from breakfast to appetizer all the way through dinner. There's always some kind of cheese put out on the table, which is my favorite thing to eat when I'm in Greece. Okay, so our mixture is all ready. I'm gonna get you started on our phyllo dough, which I know a lot of people get nervous with phyllo dough, but I don't want you to be nervous today. I'm gonna walk you through everything. I'm just gonna rinse my hands.
I actually worked for the first time in my life with homemade phyllo dough at five years old. Uh, my tenant that lived with us in the Bronx, she used to watch me when I got home from kindergarten and she would always be rolling out her own dough and I was have been fascinated with it since then. So whenever I smell the homemade phyllo dough being made, I don't know if it's the cornstarch or the flour, it literally transports me right back to her little kitchen and her rolling out this dough like she, I, 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 I can roll my own dough. I still can't roll it as good as she did. She was amazing. So I, I have that story, Melina. Yeah. We it, have a question for you. So Linda yeah. asked, um, do you prefer to buy feta in a block? Uh, well, I prefer to eat feta from a block, but <laughs> when I'm working with um, using it in a dish, it's, it's easier to, to use the crumbled cheese because it's already crumbled up for you. And you don't want to sit there crunching it and, you know, crumbling it down. But when I buy it for home, I buy it in a block. And I mean, I drizzle olive oil on it, oregano. Sometimes I'll do honey on it and just eat it right like that's my meal. I come home and I'm like, oh, thank goodness there's good feta cheese in my refrigerator. And that's my dinner. Yum. So it depends on what you're using it for basically. So mm -hmm. I'm going to use for you today, uh, I'm not going to roll out my own phyllo dough because that'll take, that'll be a whole other show. Uh, I'm going to use Kanto's Foods uh, phyllo dough today. And phyllo dough, just so you know, has different numbers on it. And it starts from the number four, which is the thinnest. There's a number five, there's a number seven, there's a number 10, which is considered the country dough. So that's your thick, thick phyllo. So if you want to make it look like you are from the village in Greece and you actually did make it yourself, you want to go with the number 10 and you can tell people you made it yourself, they'll probably believe you. Um, and then there's also another one that's more like a, uh, it's like a Greek style of puff pastry, just not as flaky, but there are different. I'm going to use the number four today for this one, but it, with a cheese pie or any kind of pies, I find the hardier pies like that have a lot of vegetables or meats inside of them. I tend to go with the number seven just so that it really holds in all the ingredients. Baking wise as well, you can go with a number four or number five. So we have our phyllo dough here, got our pan ready. We have our butter melted butter. We always use butter working with phyllo dough. Butter is huge in Greece with baking. Uh, butter cookies are very, very famous throughout Greece. Melina, while you're getting yeah. the phyllo dough out, so we have some questions about the, the secret cinnamon shortbread cookie that we were talking about earlier. Do you yes. know how to spell it by chance? I think people are trying to look it up. Yes, it's kind of hard. It's M-O-U-S-T-K- O L O U R A. <laughs> Mustokulura. It's a tongue twister, but it's a good one. And there's different kinds too. So depending on what kind of cookie you had, because some people make them hard, so they're like good like dunking cookie into um, a coffee or tea. And some people make them on the soft side, so they're very cakey. The cakey version does not use sugar. The hard version actually uses sugar. I found that out. I was searching and searching for that soft cakey cookie. And hmm. the cakey one does not use sugar at all. Okay, so we want to basically get our first layer of butter down using our nice little pastry brush. Thank you girls for sending this to me. Yes. So you just wanna layer the bottom so that nothing sticks. And I did cut the phyllo dough in half because of my, the size of my pan. This is a quarter sheet. Normally at home, I make like industrial size pies. So I leave the phyllo dough whole, but here we wanna just cut it so that everything fits neatly. So I did cut it in half. We're gonna just layer, we're gonna do probably about six layers on the bottom. Can you do me a favor and just... This needs to go in the yep. microwave. I just need to warm the butter up a little because it did get a little hard for me. So we're gonna do about six layers on the bottom and I'm gonna show you how to envelope in the ingredients so that the cheese doesn't ooze out when it's baking. So you wanna just layer. Your first one's gonna go flat down. Your second one is gonna hang over like this off the side. So we're gonna do that on each side. And you want to layer in every layer. 
the reason we layer is because if you don't put a little bit of butter or olive oil you can use as well, the layers will become very soggy. They won't bake crispy golden brown. Um, they will be on the soggier side. So just important to keep the layers nice and moist. Not too much, but just enough. Here's my butter back. And phyllo dough, I know a lot of people do get nervous to work with it. If it's a fresh phyllo, it's gonna be beautiful like this, where you're not, it's not coming out of the package crumbled. It's very soft on the hands. Um, so you wanna get to, if you can get to a, a Mediterranean market somewhere that would sell phyllo, you want it out of the refrigerator and not out of the freezer. Cause the freezer one is the one that tends to break when you thaw it. It almost felt like very soft tissue paper. Yeah, when I yeah. Worked with it for the first time. And I actually just two days ago mastered my first gluten free homemade phyllo dough. It came out so delicious, we couldn't even tell the difference between the regular and the gluten free. So I will be going to Greece in September. Does anybody want to join me? I will be there uh, working on my first cookbook all about phyllo dough, doing a little photo shoot. And I am actually going to be filming a promo video uh, for pitching to a network uh, all about Greece and the little areas that I'm going to. So if anybody would like to join me, you are more than welcome to come aboard because we have adventures set up like you don't even know. <laughs> well, count me in. Yeah, yes. People Let's better go. speak up in the chat. It's an open yeah, come on. <laughs> and actually, where are you going, Melina? Wow, I am going to. So I'm actually going to islands off of central Greece. Uh, the one island is called Skiathos. The other island is called Skopelos, which is AKA the Mamma Mia island. So Mamma Mia was filmed there where they filmed the chapel all the way up. Um, and then this other little island off of there called Alonisos, which is very known for their um, sea life. They have an incredible uh, uh, marine world over there with dolphins and all sorts of beautiful sea animals. And then we are gonna be heading over to the Saronic Gulf side, which is Spetses, uh, which is where you'll always find me. If you drop my name when you go, I guarantee you, they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, we know her. <laughs> Um, well, Martha said she'll go if you promise she can sample everything you cook. Everything. You can sample, <laughs> you can help me. The more helps, the better. As you can see, I have somebody handing me filo dough here because I love <laughs> help. All right. So I'm going to go in and layer our uh, dough right now. So I'll put this down so you can see. Ooh. Mm. That looks beautiful. Yeah, so much cheese. It's one of my favorite things to make. This is my first, um, this was the first actually filo dough uh, creation that I ever made because it's always been my favorite growing up. My aunt always made the best tiropita and I swore in my 20s I was going to learn how to make my own and I did and I nailed it. <laughs> and everybody always tells me that mine is the best. Maybe they're just lying, but I don't think so. <laughs> Will you tell us what's in it again? So I know the feta. Yeah, so this is feta cheese uh, and cream cheese, ricotta cheese, uh, basically, and your, your two eggs in here. And depending on how big of a tray you wanna do, you can double the recipe. If you're doing it, you're having a party, you can make this the day before, two days before, and don't bake it out till the day of the event. You can layer the whole thing, get it in the fridge, and bake it out, you know, just before the event. So it's a great little appetizer to any type of party. Feeds a lot of people. It's a nice wow factor. Oh, what's in there? <laughs> and it actually was quite simple. Yeah, it's simple. And yeah. like I said, it's, it's so easy to add other things to this. You know, like I said, whatever you have in your refrigerator vegetable wise, um, 
get everything incorporated. Uh, I do tend to sometimes cook or saute the vegetables before I add them into this. Oh, okay, so we, I think you might have just answered this question, but Melinda said, if you decide to add other ingredients like spinach, yes. do you mix it in or do you layer it on top of the cheese? And then everything right in, in the bowl and mix everything so they're all well incorporated because you want okay. everything nice and um, well uh, assembled inside the, the pita. And then would you cook the vegetables before doing some, that or just- some, some I do. For some reason with the spinach, I saute my scallion first in a little butter, but I do use the spinach, uh, I do use the spinach raw, but you have to be very careful with the vegetables. Spinach especially, you need to strain. If you're mm. using frozen, you thaw it, it needs to be strained so that the liquid does not go through and make the, the recipe watery. So mm. strain your spinach very well. Uh, when I do leek pie, I do cook the leeks, salt and pepper, a little scallion as well, butter and sauteed in a pan. So the leeks I do cook as well. The spinach I don't. Uh, zucchini I do cook. Uh, I do make a really good uh, pepper and uh, it's a chicken, kotopita it's called, it's a chicken pie with peppers. I cook all those vegetables. We could go on for hours here with my creations. Well, <laughs> what about, so someone asked about herbs. Do you ever add herbs to the churro pita? Uh, I do, not to this, to not to my cheese pie and not really to my uh, spanakopita, the spinach pie. But I do know a lot of people uh, do use a lot of dill with the spinach pie. Uh, my recipe does not call for it, but you can always add it if you like it. I did add some dill to mine, but I'm Polish. So that's, yeah. <laughs> we love our dill. I'm, I'm, you know, with my dill, like I like it in my tzatziki. I like it in another couple other Greek vegetable dishes, but for some reason, I don't know if it's because the way I grew up eating spanakopita, it never had it. So I tend to, to, to leave it out. But when I do a vegetable pie, which is um, actually uh, my friend, Diane Kochilis's recipe, which is her, her Ikarian pie, which her longevity pie, all vegetables and that one I do use dill and fresh parsley and that it's it's delicious. Yeah. Okay, so we want to what I want to show you right now is how to close this. So we put a couple layers down and now I want to seal up this little envelope so none of our cheeses sneak out on us. There's a question if you ever use kefalotiri. Uh, if I ever use kefalotiri, uh, I do use kefalotiri uh, in another pie that I make that's uh, with the leeks. It is from a recipe from Northern Greece uh, in the area of Kozani. And they are very famous for their leek pies. And that does tend to use that cheese in it. And it's very, very good. So we wanna take our little butter knife here and just make sure we get all the edges in good. I'm a stickler for beautiful edges on my cheese pie. So when I train people, yeah, they get mad at me. They're like, what do you mean this isn't perfect? Nope, you need to fix the right-hand corner, does not meet my standards. <laughs> but if you do it at home, don't worry, I won't yell at you, I promise. So now the rest of the layers, we're just gonna keep tucking and buttering. So we want our, we want our, our top layer to look just beautiful before it goes in the oven. They're actually filming right now on the island of Spetses that I go to. Um, so if you look it up online, they are filming Knives Out too. So Kate Hudson is there, uh, Daniel Craig is there. Uh, so there's a lot of action going on on my little island these days. And I'm missing out on all the fun until I get there in September. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going, Melina? September? I'm going September, the weekend of Labor Day weekend I leave. Not sure when I'm coming back. <laughs> Maybe never. Is this an open-ended? <laughs> according to according open to William ticket. Sonoma, they're like, you better get back real quick. The holiday season is coming. We need you. <laughs> so see, it doesn't need so much butter, just enough to give it that nice buttery taste Crispy. mixed with the cheeses. It's so delicious. All right. So I think this could be our last little mm -hmm. layer here.
Yours is much prettier than the one that I made, but. Well, now you have my secret trick to tuck your corners in and now you'll make it perfect too. And this uh, cheese pie too in Greece, you can eat it, uh, like I said, olive oil uh, on top, but to make a cheese pie and then drizzle even honey on top of it, mm, it's like you get your sweet and savory. It's delicious. People can driz drizzle their slide ridge honey. Um, yes, I was so excited when I have, I'm going to do that for you. <laughs> See, I brought my little honey. Product uh, placement. <laughs> okay. So we just want to get it nice and buttered up here on top. And then the other trick before it goes in the oven, you want to score it because <laughs> filo dough, when it comes out of the oven, if you don't cut it, it gets very messy. Mm. So you just want to, depending on, you know, how big you want your pieces, just score the top. I'm not touching the bottom of the pan. So you don't need to cut through all no, the way to the bottom. I just want to make sure the top layer at least gets cut because I mean, it's, it's not awful if you don't, but it just will be very messy when you're trying to cut the slices, it'll start to flake on you. So if they're already pre-scored, you're going to go in and the pieces going to pop out just beautifully. So look how beautiful. Wow. Yes. Pre-scored, ready to go into the oven. And you want to cook this at 350. Everybody always makes fun of me. Lena, you cook everything at 350. And I said, that's that's my thing. When in doubt, 350 it out. That's it. 350 <laughs> is the, that's my standard baking instructions. It's 350. So we put this in for 350 in our oven. And then when it comes out, it's going to look oh. like this. So you want it to have this beautiful golden brown color to it. It's nice and flaky. It smells so good wow will you show us a cut piece real quick yeah Do you have a plate? and then and then we'll we'll bring serena on to teach us some nutrition that looks perfect yeah everyone everyone in the chat is saying yum looks delicious Aww. looks amazing we'll make it together one day i'm gonna i'm gonna set up the, the plan for greece for us don't worry <laughs> so like i said if you want to take you open that Oh, Lori asked, how long do you bake it for? Uh, it's usually about 45 minutes. You want it to just get that nice, beautiful golden brown. And like I said, if you want to just take oh, look at that. Honey and drizzle right over, this is so delicious. It just gives you that sweet savory in every bite. So here you oh, go. My Here's my cheese pie, my tiropita. I hope you guys all make it. And you can always write me if you have questions. I'm usually never sleep. So I guarantee you, I'll be answering you whatever time you write me um, because yeah, I don't sleep. Well, yeah. I think we're all just packing our bags to show up at your door. To yes, come. come on over, every one of you. I would love it. I love company. I'm a Greek. We cook so much food. It's like a staple. If you don't have leftovers, you did not cook enough and you're not a Gre nice right. Greek girl. So I always cook tons of food. My son today started uh, work at a camp local. I go and buy cold cuts like the normal mother. And he says, can you make chicken and rice and drop it off for me? Like, oh, here we go again. Why can't you eat a sandwich? No, he wanted, he wanted cheese pie. He wanted his chicken and rice. And I had to send him melamacarana cookies too. So well, I, have over. I have plenty of chicken rice on the stove too. Melina, that was amazing. It looks delicious. Thank you so much for the demo. We're going to welcome Serena back on. I'm going to go ahead and bring some slides up. Melina, that looked amazing. I'm just, I'm jumping on a plane from St. Louis to New Jersey, like right after I'm done here. So I wish, I wish. Oh, looks so yummy. All right. So what else would we eat besides tiropita pie if we were traveling in Greece? This is what a typical daily uh, meal would look like. Greeks generally start out with a small breakfast, uh, maybe a cup of herbal tea with some honey, or maybe some coffee. And then maybe dry bread or paximati, which is sort of a, it's sort of like that uh, cookie that we just talked about. It's more of a 
mix between a, a biscotti and a savory um, rusk. So something um, smaller for breakfast. But then because they have that smaller breakfast, and this is probably the reason that they do, it's so they can eat spanakopita or tsiropita as a morning snack, maybe around 11 or so. But then it's the midday meal that is the main meal of the day. And that's maybe around two or three um, in the afternoon. And if you're at home, you would probably eat a vegetable casserole, really a hearty one or a hearty vegetable stew. Um, as Melina said, there isn't a ton of meat, maybe at home. You would also have some feta cheese and a salad, maybe a glass of wine as well. Well, of course, a glass of wine. And then if you're at a restaurant, you would have something more hearty, maybe a plate of fried sardines or anchovies, um, along with uh, a, a couple more meze or salads um, that we'll talk about in a minute here. And then Greeks love their afternoon coffee. As, as I said, I make a cup, me cup of, of uh, Greek coffee. Greek coffee is made in a long handled um, brika, which is um, a long handled, tiny little pot. So the handle is actually a little bit longer than the pot itself, but the pot is um, where the coffee grounds and the water are boiled to together. And there's a special type of coffee ground that uh, Greeks use. So you would wanna look for that in a specialty store because it's not the same as just grinding your regular coffee really, really fine. It's actually a special type that comes from um, different places around the world that is a unique, uh, a unique formulation um, for the, your Greek coffee. But you boil the water and the grounds together and you take it off the stove and you let it settle a little bit and then you pour it into your cup and you have a small Demitas cup and it's actually not as high in caffeine as an espresso, as you might think. So that's why it's that special type of um, coffee. You probably wouldn't serve it with milk, but you would serve it with a lot of sugar, yum. Um, but this picture here in the slide, uh, of course the, the influence of the cafe lattes from around the world have made it to Greece. So uh, occasionally Greece will drink it with milk now. And of course, Starbucks is in Greece too. There's 28 Starbucks stores. so. Um, more uh, protein from the from the milk is also um, a coming trend too, as more people around the world like to eat more protein at different times throughout the meal, throughout the day. They would eat it with a cookie, usually their, their afternoon coffee. And there is actually one um, type of cookie that can be traced back to ancient Greece. It's a type of sort of a, it's more like a candy bar, it's called pastelli which is sesame seeds baked in honey that you can actually trace back to ancient Greece, which, and they're so yummy, so delicious. And then it's the afternoon or the late dinner, which is more of a meze style dinner. Next slide, please. That would be um, lots and lots of small plates, which I don't know about you, but I love the sort of small plate kind of dining that we used to see in restaurants before COVID, but now we're seeing again. And, has actually been a lot of the way I, I cook um, the last year where I just pull different dips and things out of the fridge and serve it to the family and hey, that's dinner. But in Greece, that's they've been doing that for generations and it could be anything from different dips to salads, cheese, nuts, olives, um, some simple grilled vegetables or tinned seafoods, yummy, yummy tinned seafoods that you can find um, in Greece. Uh, the different types of small fishes, often in delicious, high quality olive oil. Don't drain that. You want to eat some of that too, because uh, of course you've got the benefits from the olive oil and the fishes when you consume that. So what types of dips would you have? Well, there's three that are very, very famous that are eaten together and often found together in restaurants and at home. And that would be your uh, traditional hummus or hummus, but on Greece, it's usually made not with chickpeas. That's more of a Middle Eastern thing. It's still found in Greece out uh, of chickpeas, but more than often, it's a type of split pea. And so that is pureed together um, with lemon and served warm. And it's kind of that tart, creamy, warm uh, dip. And then zetsiki, another famous one, which is the Greek yogurt date based dip with dill and um, cucumber and lots of garlic. And then lastly is the one in your, um, in your dairy box, which is the hitipipi. And that is the, um, the Greek yogurt, or sorry, the 
feta cheese with peppers. And it can be anything like spicy peppers, or it can be the um, not so spicy, and you can have the, um, it, it, it's, it's more of like a cooling dip. So this is the one, and this is the one um, from my cookbook that is the head to pee. And then you might serve those alongside, as I said, one of the, some of the cooling dips are served with maybe some grilled meats um, that might be spicy or maybe some other grilled vegetables. So next slide, please. What would you drink? The house wine. House wine in Greece is one of the most best kept secrets in Europe. And that is because many of the Greek producers of wine are very small and they do not export their delicious product. Instead, they serve it, they uh, sell it to local restaurants. And so it is the thing to order. Um, when we were there, we always just grab um, whatever's basically on tap. They have it in a barrel usually in the back and serve it out of the barrel. And we could see them pouring it in there or they'll have it in a, in a, a bottle too. And it is delicious. And you're probably not going to taste those grapes or those flavors anyplace else. One fun fact, although Greece was, did not invent wine, they basically made it for the masses. So uh, many, many years ago, um, back all the way to antiquity, they did not drink straight up wine. In fact, they considered it barbaric to drink straight up wine. They often uh, would drink it up to um, in a ratio of 20 to 1, 10 to 1, and that's water to wine. Um, but anything um, below two to one uh, ratio of water to wine was considered barbaric. So if anyone tells you that you not put an ice cube or anything in your wine, tell them that's the way that ancient Greeks used to, um, to drink it and they almost invented it. All right, secondly, ouzo, of course, that's the licorice flavored um, or fennel flavored uh, aperitif, but it's also drunk as a digestive as well. Next slide. All right, these are the dietary guidelines for Greek adults. They came out from the government in 2017, and they are very similar to the dietary guidelines for Americans, but I might, you can see that um, around there, many of the uh, foods from the Mediterranean diet, the yogurt, the fruits and vegetables, legumes, beans, olive oil, but I would point you to number five, where you see that the Greek government points out um, that those small fatty fishes are the ones that are most traditional in the Greek diet, and they have some of the best benefits, but they're also very sustainable. So they highlight those in there. And then, of course, number seven, um, the Greek government tells their citizens to choose olive oil first, which, of course, makes lots of sense because they grow it there, and it's the traditional Mediterranean diet um, fat. All right, next slide. All right, so what would you eat if you were on Greece or how do you eat like a Greek? It's another way to ask it. To ask it. Um, I'm gonna go through a couple of different dishes and then because I um, do a lot of these cooking or, and educational seminars on the Mediterranean diet, people always ask me, well, how do you, how do you eat Mediterranean just simple steps? So I'll include a couple of different simple steps but if you just do these couple little things, you can eat more Mediterranean, eat like a Greek, and hopefully improve your health by um, taking these simple steps to eat more of the Mediterranean diet. All right, so for this first dip, this is um, a recipe from my book. It is um, tomatoes and shrimp cooked together, and then you add a big block of feta, and then you scoop everything up with a piece of pita bread. But it's very similar to the Greek dish called biryani, which is very, um, very traditional. And that is sort of a Greek ratatouille. So it's tomatoes and peppers and zucchini. And then the, it has also, like I said earlier, um, Greeks eat a lot of potatoes. It, they include in potatoes in their biryani dish. So that's very traditional. And um, again, it would be served with some feta cheese. All right, next slide. So that feta cheese, I, we already had that question about eating a block of feta versus the crumbles. Both are great, both, both are super high in nutrition. Um, you obviously had your um, Gold Farms feta in your box, but Greeks eat a ton of feta as, um, as, Melania, as Melina said, 
And why? Well, of course, everything is better with feta, right? So they eat, um, they're one of the highest consumers of cheese in the Europe and actually in the world. And about half of their cheese consumption is feta. They eat about 10 pounds a year. And on Greece, it's traditionally uh, sheep's and cow's milk, sorry, sheep's and goat's milk together or just sheep's milk. But we can't get a lot of that. So we're so happy that Gold Creek Farms makes their yummy feta. And it has very high, it's very high in nutrition, um, high in calcium, potassium, magnesium, and of course, protein. But it's a higher water content cheese. So, and it's a super hot, very flavorful cheese because um, it's soaked in a brine. And so it's, and it's got that um, kind of tangy taste to it. So you actually can use a little less of it as you, than you might other types of cheeses because it's so yummy and flavorful. And one trick, if you do need to reduce the salt content of your cheese, one reason to buy the block of feta over the crumbles is you can rinse the block and then you can lower the salt content of the cheese. So that's a great way to um, use it. And it, it also um, has kind of a creamier taste as well. So I agree with Melina, I like to, when I'm gonna eat it, I like to use it that way. If I'm gonna use it on a dish or crumble it on top of a pizza or something, then I might buy the crumbles. All right, next slide, please. All right, and then we've got our halloume, and that also came in your box. Um, that's this grilling cheese. Now, what is a grilling cheese? Grilling cheese means that it is very, um, it's, it's, a, it's a cheese that has a high melting point. And so if you were to stick a slab of mozzarella on the grill or cheddar, it would fall right through the grill grates, right? But not halloumi, you can put a thick slab of halloumi on there and instead it will get all toasty and brown on the outside and it will get, um, it will not melt on the inside. We, you have some um, on your recipe sheet, but you can see this one. Um, I have these nice grill grates, nice grill um, lines and it's nice and toasty on the outside, but um, melty on the inside. And the reason why, it's so interesting to me um, to learn how this cheese is made, just like all other cheeses, it, it's made with three ingredients. So that's your milk, your salt, and then your rennet. So you bring your milk and your salt to a warming temperature. You add your rennet, it separates the curds in the whey. And then with other cheeses, you would take those curds and you would scoop them into a um, mold and then you would press it and then you would have your cheese and you would also add your culture. So you would add your cheddar culture to make it cheddar or you would add your blue culture to make it blue. But with halloumi, you take those curds and you don't put them into the mold. Instead, you heat them again. And because you heat them again, it has that higher melting temperature. And I was able to find some halloumi in my local store, but if you can't find halloumi and you wanna make this salad um, in your box, you can also use regular string cheese because it has a little bit higher melting point, but you just wanna freeze it first before you grill it because then it will sort of maintain it and, you know, watch it really closely so it doesn't fall through the grates. But this is um, a very traditional way to eat halloumi. This is, um, it was, halloumi was in, was um, the traditional cheese of Cyprus. And that's where they eat it with watermelon in the summertime. Um, and you have the grilled halloumi with the refreshing sweet watermelon. It's such an awesome combination together. All right, next slide, please. And this is a picture of that halloumi that you have in your box with the um, with a herb salad. So that's another way to use um, the uh, to eat more Mediterranean is to eat more herbs. So I always tell people that Americans eat tablespoons of herbs, eat the Mediterranean way, and eat cupfuls of herbs. So you know how you go to the grocery store and you grab a, or if you have some in your garden. Um, you grab a uh, bunch of herbs and you use one tablespoon or two tablespoons in a dish. And then the rest of it just goes limp and slimy in the bottom of your refrigerator. But if you eat more Mediterranean and eat cupfuls of herbs, so adding it to salads like we do in this one, um, or adding it to any recipe, I guarantee any recipe that calls for a tablespoon of herb will be just as delicious with a cup full of herb. And it will be all kinds of benefits. It's, herbs are high in antioxidants, so high in nutrition. 
um, herbs will not go bad as bad in your in the bottom of your fridge, and you'll have less food waste, and you will um, be able to have better flavor in those dishes when you add more herbs to basically anything that you cook. All right, next slide. This is a yummy lentil whole grain vegetable soup. I talked about that a little bit earlier. That would be a typical meal in um, for a midday meal. This is a recipe in our book that's a mushroom farro soup. And one way that we kick up the flavor of that is to add acid. So that's the, one of the best ways to eat more Mediterranean. So whether your acid is lemons and adding lemon juice to the end of something. Um, a lot of times you're cooking your soup or a stew and you're like, oh, this just needs something. It just needs something else. Um, and normally you might grab the salt shaker and shake some salt in there. Don't. First try adding just a tablespoon, just one tablespoon of lemon juice or red wine vinegar, which is what is in this dish, or even uh, rice wine vinegar, or even even distilled vinegar. Add that little bit of acid and it just adds more deliciousness to it. It's that salt, it's that sour um, taste that just kind of, or tart taste that just kind of perks up your taste buds and makes the food kind of sparkle. It just makes it more delicious. So try adding that. All right, next slide. All right, and then lastly, to, another last way to eat more Mediterranean is to use Greek yogurt. So use Greek yogurt in savory preparation. So this is a picture of a typical beet salad. Um, there's one in my book that uses just shredded raw beets with um, carrots and apples and walnuts and then Greek yogurt and lemon juice and a little bit of honey. And together all those um, sweet savory combinations just make a delicious salad with a few ingredients. But one way that we always have Greek yogurt in my house is um, when my kids don't like something, uh, which can happen, um, believe it or not, I'm a dietitian, yes, and I have kids that don't eat fish. So we put a bowl of Greek yogurt on almost every um, meal that we have. And when the kids don't like something, they can grab a scoop of Greek yogurt and spread that on there. And sometimes it takes off the taste. Sometimes it makes it just more delicious because you kind of have that tart flavor and that creamy flavor that um, makes it more of a familiar flavor for the kids. And so they enjoy their food more um, with those savory combinations of Greek yogurt. And of course, Greek yogurt is super nutritious. You've got your probiotics, your calcium, magnesium, um, protein, all of those things. Most Americans don't get enough um, magnesium and potassium. So those are two nutrients that Greek yogurt does have that you can add to more of your diet. So eating it along with a spicy grilled anything or a spicy um, uh, food that, that um, will have that nice contrast with it is a great way uh, to use Greek yogurt. All right, next slide. So I'm going to leave you here with a few Greek ingredients that you can peruse. And of course, adding any of those items to your cooking would make it more Greek. I also wanted to show um, the Hirotipi dip that um, is in your dish or is in your box. This is um, the recipe from my book. And here is what it sort of looks like. Oh, it's kind of washed out here. But you don't have to use a food processor in it. That's one of the things that I mentioned in there. You can actually just use a, um, a blender and or, or a, um, a KitchenAid mixer, and it will come out just beautiful with those um, red peppers in there as well. All right. I don't know how, many, how much time we have for questions here, Anne. Yeah, so we're out of time for questions, but we got to share so much good information. Um, I want to make sure everyone sees this slide. So this is Chef Melina and Serena's contact info. So they have said, reach out to them, engage with them on social media. Um, they'd love to hear more from you. So definitely don't hesitate to get in touch with either of them. And before we wrap up, um, well, actually one more thing. I just wanna say thank you so much to both of you for, for joining us today and sharing all of your knowledge and all of your good tips around cooking. It was so much fun. It was a wonderful episode. Um, for everyone on the line, we have one more thing. So if you've attended our episodes before, you know that we do a raffle at the end of each episode. And so this time we have another awesome giveaway. We have 
Serena's Easy Everyday Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, which is signed. We have an Instapot, a Springform pan, so you can make Melina's cheesecake. And then look at what Melina's wearing, if you can see her, because her evil eye apron. And then she's got some um, evil eye soap is included yeah. in the box. We love so. our evil eyes. <laughs> So can I get a drum roll, please? The winner for today is Teresa Crillard. So Teresa, congratulations. We'll reach out to you um, after the episode and grab your information to get you your raffle box. Thanks again to everyone for joining today. Um, Melina and Serena, any last notes that you want to leave with Wait, everyone I just, on the line? I just want to say one thing, Serena. <laughs> If you, when you go to Greece and you ask for Greek coffee, don't ask for a brika because you just asked for a dowry. <laughs> it's briki is the coffee. The brika is a whole other meaning. It's your dowry when you're getting married. So you don't want a brika. <laughs> that's hilarious. No, I definitely need to get, brush up on my Greek 101, but that's why we got you, Melina. You just like, yeah. da 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 and spell it up. It's so fun. Well, that's, that's our, all of our takeaways then. Yeah. Thank you again, you guys. Thanks to everyone for joining. We have our Brazil teaser for you. So we hope to see you on August 25th from 12 to 1, 15 p.m. Mountain Time, episode four. We're going to Brazil. And we have our um, nutrition expert, Ariane Orr, who's about to give you a teaser for the episode. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Bye. Oi, sou a Ariane Orr, sou nutricionista formada no Brasil e também dietista registrada em Salt Lake City, Utah. Vou levar vocês num passeio virtual pelo Brasil e mostrar um pouquinho sobre a cozinha e a cultura brasileira. Nos vemos dia 25 de agosto.